Then they came up with a number of other um, observations that were quite poignant. And what we did was then involve them in the design of our patient and family-centered uh, care model. And in fact, it wasn't called patient and family-centered care originally, and it was really around interprofessional care because we were working on teamwork. I don't know if in your hospital you have a little challenge with teamwork, but we do. And so, again, a nice thing that everyone talks about the importance of, but somehow it's hard to do. So you know what happens when you put into professionals, put all the professionals in the room and you talk about teamwork, there's always a reason why something can't work. When you start talking about teamwork and you know the importance of teamwork and you invite a patient to sit at that table and listen to how we talk, the conversation starts to change. Because their views, their voices, their ears, when you actually put yourself in their shoes and you listen to the way we talk about what we do and why we do it and the rules we have and why we are and aren't going to do something, the language that we use, it's very confusing and a lot of it doesn't make good sense. So we decided to open up through after those initial experiences, open up the various conversations and groups where people were meeting on, on various challenges. I don't know about you, but for 30 years in my career, we've been trying to get people from the emergency department up onto the unit in a timely manner. This is a universal problem. I can't figure out yet why this is such a challenging problem to solve, but it is. So what did we do in our hospital? We had that problem, so we invited patients and families to be part of that. And they, that started the, um, a number of different initiatives where that became the normal practice of inviting and encouraging patients and families to be part of quality improvement initiatives. But it wasn't easy when we started. And I'll tell you, when we started and when we learned, we learned a lot about the risks of this because we had some of those folks, remember, from that first meeting who said, hmm, we're not really sure about all this. And if you invite someone to a meeting and you don't really include them, you don't really listen, you don't really seem to care about what they have to say, but you've ticked it off the list because you have one of them there, they know it and feel it in a heartbeat. And then our patients and families in the early days, they called us out on it and said, uh-uh, this is not the way it's going to work. I thought that's good for them because what we needed to do was make this a meaningful exchange. And that's where we were committed to do that. So some of the early practices that we put in place, that it really stemmed from the focus of how to make that very core experience for patients and families better. And it better from their perspective, not from better from our perspective. And so by bringing that patient and family voice into the room, it does change things, but only if you actually listen. Then there were those who said, oh my gosh, if you put the patients in there, they're going to want us to paint the hospital purple, or they're going to want us to spend all kinds of money we don't have, or they're going to, they're going to advocate for things that they believe in. Hmm. Had a physician say, you know, all this, you know, they come with an agenda. I thought, have you ever been to one of your meetings? <laughs> right? So in fact, if we could raise the bar of having meetings where people actually listened to each other, they respected each other's views, they put each other in, their, in each other's shoes, and they actually always came to, well, what value does this create for patients and families? We'd have a lot of good meetings.